following program is recorded content created by the Truth Network. It's Matt Slick Live. Matt is the founder and president of the Christian Apologetics Research Ministry, found online at CARM.org. When you have questions about Bible doctrines, turn to Matt Slick Live for answers. Taking your calls and responding to your questions at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everyone, welcome to the show. It's me, Matt Slick, and you're listening to Matt Slick Live. I hope you're all having a good day today, and that if you are so inclined, you'll give me a call and we can talk. If you have a comment or a question, all you have to do is dial 877-207-2276, and we can talk. Easy, easy to do. If you have a comment or a question you want to send via email, all you have to do is Set it to info at carm.org, info at carm.org, C-A-R-M dot O-R-G, and uh, put in the subject line, put in uh, radio comment or radio question, and we can uh, we can get to it. All right, all right, all right. I'm looking and checking and per- per- uh, perusing. Let's see, the various things we've got going. Okay, looks good. All right, there we go. So, hey, like I said, if you want to give me a call, 877-207-2276. So, um, we got a lot of radio questions, and I got something on my mind, too. So, later this month, I'll be here in Idaho uh, speaking at a conference, and they gave me a text out of the scriptures to speak on, uh, out of uh, Put on the Armor of God. And they want me to speak on the issue twice, an hour each, uh, expositing those scriptures and laying the foundation for equipping Christians. And uh, it's going to be interesting because um, I want to get deep. I'm thinking what I'm going to do is for the first hour do uh, do um, just you know an intro-ish kind of a level thing, and then I'm going to next hour I'm going to warn them. I'm saying I'm going to get deeper. I'm going to get some complicated stuff, but I'm going to have a slideshow and all this stuff and lay things out. I think I'll do a, uh, a uh, you know, get um, handouts also. We'll see and do that as well. So I'm looking forward to doing that. i got to start prepping the lessons this week, and I'll be converting it to uh, PowerPoint, which I like to do. I've learned a lot of nice tricks in PowerPoint. I can make things move, slide, blend, all kinds of things. So when I do stuff like that, and I use those. Um, I try to make it go really uh, smooth so that people go, ooh, look at that. So that's a lot of fun for me. All right. So we don't have any callers waiting right now. So what I'm going to do is get to some of the uh, <laughs> some of the radio questions and comments. I got this one yesterday who was King James, and I talked about that, how I answer questions like that from my wife. In an irritating way, she says, who's King James? He was a king named James. And uh, and she gives me this weird stare, you know, like I said something wrong. So uh, there's that. Let me uh, me get into, let's see, radio questions. Let's try this one. Oh, I can't, uh, here's a, it's a, I don't know, why is it in the, in the, uh, the radio question thing? Because it's a link to something. And I can't, you know, I can't listen to a link or watch a link during that time. Or now. Uh, let's see, are either of the following views acceptable? Uh, full preterism and partial preterism? That reminds me. So, last night, uh, there's another apologist I'm friends with, uh, Andrew Rappaport. And I went on his show. They were discussing martial arts and yoga. Can Christians do martial arts and yoga? And in the after show, we got talking about end times. So anyway, and so we talked about martial arts. I've done years of martial arts, and the other guys there uh, in the panel, we all done years of martial arts. They even had a martial arts instructor there. They're all Christians. And so we got talking about that. And yes, it's okay to take martial arts. And yoga, however, is official yoga is occultic, and it goes into chakra balancing and energy movement and some weird stuff like that. And that's not good. But stretching and doing the same movements of, uh, that yoga might have, you know, put your legs together and your, you know, call the lotus position, it, you can stretch, you know, stretching's not going to hurt you. If you got talking about that as well, as long as you're not involved in the occult stuff, 
not a problem. And then we got talking in the after show with one of the guys about uh, eschatology. Eschatology, preterism, full preterism, and uh, post-millennialism and all millennialism and stuff like that. This is the after show. We just, it was a friendly discussion, really nice. It was a good friendly discussion. And so we got, you know, point, uh, point counterpoint. And I developed something on the, on the fly that I'd never thought of that is against post-millennialism. Now, I'm not saying it's a dumb position. No, I'm not. Uh, but I, I don't, I'm not a post-millennialist. And what the, that position is, is that the millennium of Christ is not a literal thousand years, it's a figurative period, which I agree with, considering how the term is used in Revelation 20. And where I believe things are going to get really bad towards the end, they teach that things are going to get really good towards the end. That's the basic view, that the gospel will go out, there will be mass conversions all over the world, and things like that. Well, that's within Christian, uh, uh, with my own male position too. All right, so we got talking, and I came up with something. I'm going to share it with you and see what you think. So my view is that things are going to get, going to get worse and worse. And we got talking about something. I forgot how we got onto it. And it, it, I went, wait a minute. The Nephilim of Genesis 6 the Nephilim were the uh, offspring, of the, the half-breed offspring of the fallen angels and women. This is what the Jews always taught. This is what the Christian church always taught until the 500s when it was ridiculed and they came up with a different theory. But this is what the Jews had already hold, held to, and I, I believe that position. In Genesis 6, where it talks about the Nephilim, it mentions in verse 9 that Noah was perfect in all his generations. He was... Uh, he was uh, his, his ancestry was was uncorrupted. Now, why would that be put in there? You know, why would that be put in there if it was just uh, some other weird theory or something? But at any rate, so what's interesting also is I went to Daniel two forty three. In Daniel two forty three, it it's uh, in the context of eschatology of the end times, because in Daniel two it talks about. Nebuchadnezzar's uh, vision and the statue, you know, and the gold head and and uh, and the chest area is silver, and then waist is is like bronze, and the feet are like a uh, mixture of clay and iron. And uh, it's so the the feet area represents another kingdom. That's a lot of a lot, a lot of Christians uh, say that's you know future or maybe present to us now. All right, well, what's interesting is that it says, uh, and in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seat of men. So the they, uh, it's a problem. It says with the seat of men or in the seat of men. The Hebrew can be done either way. So it, for what I understand, it, it cannot be uh, people that it is discussing because the linguistics and something, I don't know. So they will combine with one another with the seed of men. They will combine with the seed of men. So that means that they is not the seed of men, but something else. So it looks like this might be in reference to the Nephilim. And the reason I'm saying this is because Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be the days of the coming of the Son of Man, where they will be eating, they will be drinking, or giving in marriage to the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came in, took them all away, or the flood came in, destroyed them all. And then two men will be taken, one will be left. That's the wicked who are taken, not the good. All right, so having laid all that out, and I said that, I said, so if we're going to be getting better, then why does it say that at the end of the age, that as it was in days of Noah, that's how it's going to be again, which was rampant wickedness all over the place. And I said, if, if we're going to be getting better in post-millennialism, then why does Jesus say, as it was in days of Noah, so shall it be again in the days of the coming of the Son of Man? And though, during those times, it, um, it was profound wickedness and evil. And he guy goes, that's a good point. It's a good question. I mean, you know, it wasn't like, hey, see, I got you. So, you know, it was. Uh, he goes, that's a good point. I think about that. And so, you know, it was it was a good discussion. And I just came up with that, and I thought I'd share that with you because by doing that it helps me anchor it. 
All right, all right. Let's get to Jackson from Los Angeles. Jackson, welcome. You're on the air. Hey, Matt. I had a question um, about God's predestination. So my question is, um, does God ultimately predestine the nature of man and not only his nature, but his will and his desire to uh, commit sin if he's one of the non-elect? Um, and does that include every action he makes or only some actions? Thank you. You have a, a super complicated question there, so we can have to break it down. So you said, does he predestine, and then a whole bunch of things. So, uh, so you said he predestined his nature, man's nature. So I don't know what that means to say that God predestines nature. What do you think that means, or I to understand? Um, his inclination to be obedient or to be disobedient. So does he predestine it? Okay, then we need to define our terms. So uh, predestination is the work of God to determine what occurs. And it says, uh, for example, in Acts 4, 27, 28, for truly in the city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. So we see right there that there is uh, the predestining of, of God's purpose, and what happened was that uh, Pontius Pilate and Herod, two individuals, along with the people of, uh, of Israel and the Gentiles, that's people groups, that they um, did what God predestined them to do. Now that's you know, it's just what it says. So let's look uh, let's look at some more uh, examples of it. Uh, let's see Romans eight twenty nine. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. Now, this is an interesting verse because it says, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. It doesn't say of everybody out there, he predestined a few. It says, of those whom he foreknew, he also. It's the same group. And then uh, Romans 8.30 says, these whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. Then 1 Corinthians 2.7, it says... Uh, uh, we speak God's wisdom, a mystery, and hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages uh, for our glory. And then uh, Ephesians 1 5, He predestined us to adoption as sons. In Ephesians 1 11, it says that uh, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will. So those are the occurrences of it, uh, except for one other one which is in a weird one in Acts 2.25, for David says to him, I saw the Lord always in my presence. And that word saw is also from the word proridzo, uh, from predestined, which is a different usage. Hmm. All right, so the reason I went to the texts uh, is because there's one, two, three, four, five, six occurrences of that, well, seven total. But six are in the context of what we're talking about. And I wanted to see what the scripture says so we get an idea of what it says. So we can say, well, this is what predestination is according to biblical doctrine. We know from Ephesians 1.11 that it's related to working all things after the counsel of his will. We also know that God predestines people and events to occur. And we know that uh, those whom he predestined, he also called. And that God predestined the wisdom of, from God from ages past. So we get back for the break. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if we, we can um, kind of summarize it a little bit and then go to the other parts of the question, okay? So hold on. Hey, folks, we'll be right back after these messages. If you want, give me a call and um, at 877-207-2276. We'll be right back. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, well, welcome back to the show. Let's get back to Jackson as soon as he is reactivated on the system here. And we'll get back on. About Does God predestined acts choices of all people? Because it's a good question. So uh, if they can activate them, I'm waiting. So we'll see. Maybe something's going on. I don't know. We've got John from Georgia on the tag argument, and Claudius from Raleigh, North Carolina. Why is it Easter Sunday and not Resurrection Sunday? That's a good question. And uh, so I'm, I'm waiting for Jackson to be activated. This is an unusual. So um, 
once I hit the hold button, I'm not able to unhold them. They have to kind of re-put them in place, and then I can activate them. So give it another few seconds. If I can't get to it, we'll, we'll get to John. We'll come back to Jackson because we'll have to do that. All right, let's see. Three, two, one. Let's get to John from Georgia. Hey, John, welcome. You're on the air, buddy. Hey, man, how you doing today? I'm hanging in there, man, hanging in there. Okay, uh, so what's dude, up, man? Um, what do you got? For, yeah, the tag argument. Well, first of all, I just want to uh, run it by you for a second to make sure I understand it completely um, because okay. I know you like defining terms and everything. So right. tag, um, God is a necessary precondition for uh, transcendentals like uh, the laws of logic and such Yes, because he makes mm-hmm. sense of it. Yes, okay. universals, transcendentals, um, yes. Yeah. Here's a, mm-hmm. I have a problem with that, twofold. One of them is, um, since you're pre con, pre assume, I'm sorry, pre assuming, I guess, I forget my words, I want to use them, sorry. It's all right. God, the Christian God, can't you just, uh, presuppose the Muslim God, or maybe atheists can presuppose, let's say, aliens, or, you understand what I mean? I mean, since yeah. you're presupposing yes. your God. Yeah. Yes, if you presuppose another position, then you see if that position can account for what we're talking about. And the Muslim God can't, for example. Within the issue of transcendentals are what's called particulars uh, and universals. So if you're sitting in a room full of identical chairs, say 100 identical chairs, a church, a uh, forum, it doesn't matter. Well, what you're looking at is what's called a primary substance. You're looking at an initial chair. And then you look to your right, to your left, there's more chairs. Well, what you're observing is our particular manifestations of a universal called chairness. You get a lot of wind there in the uh, thing. And so, uh, so what you're seeing is the one chair and many manifestations of chairness. One and many. You're seeing universal particulars. Now, this is, you know, well, what's these words mean? What's the big deal? Well, in the Trinity, God is one and many equally. And this is important because that condition provides the necessary preconditions for intelligibility, where the God of, or any any, um, single being God, single person God, like the God of Islam, can't provide the necessary preconditions because the nature of the universe is, from that perspective, is either one or many, it's either universal or particular. So is the universe comprised of many particular objects that are interrelated? But if that's the case, then what unifies them? And if without the unity, we can't have truth statements because we can't have coherence between the different objects. But if the everything is one substance, then we don't have any way of justifying true distinctions because they're all of one thing. And if that's the case, then we undermine truth statements as well. So the idea of the universe being the nature of all things existing, being one thing or many things, proposes problems. If Allah is the one who created all things, and he's going to create out of his nature, out of his essence, he's going to reflect what he is. Not what something else is, but what he is, because nothing existed in Islam until God, Allah, decided to create. Well, then, when we ask the question, what's the nature of Allah? And if he's one, not plural, not one and many, but just one, then what we have is the ultimate nature of all things reflected being the one. And if all things are out of Allah's existence and and made in his image, then that means the universe is all ultimately of one thing. But if it's just one thing, it undermines truth values and becomes self-refuting. So I know I'm going quickly. But this is the, one of the reasons that the God of Islam can't provide the necessary preconditions for intelligibility. And when I spoke with a pretty knowledgeable, philosophically knowledgeable Muslim uh, about a year ago on this, he, his response to that was, he was prepared, and his response was, well, Allah is one person, but the particular things he manifested are many. So he recognized the problem and tried to get around it that way, but it didn't solve the problem because it, it's, well, I just didn't get into the reasons why. And I showed, I told him why it doesn't work. 
And he couldn't get past that. So this is why the idea of a Unitarian being God doesn't provide the necessary preconditions for intelligibility. But in Christian Trinitarian theology, God is one and many equally. So then when we look at the universe, we can say, is it one or many? We say, no, it's one and many. We can then understand the nature of the universals, which reside in the mind and heart of God, as well as the particulars which reside in the creative work of God. And we can then unify them by presupposing that he's behind all things. And then we can count for the universality, the laws of logic, and particular manifestations between you and me. Okay? Yeah. Well, I appreciate that, Matt. But, uh, last thing, because I know you got another caller in there. Thing. That's all right. I Go appreciate ahead. your answers and how you explain it, but... <laughs> Do you have a uh, this, not just what you said, but do you explain it on calm anywhere? Or can I email you and maybe you explain it that way? Because, as you know, a two- or three-minute call, you're not going to remember everything. Right. So, so right. do you have um, anywhere I can go to maybe, you know, read that and have it? Well, let me see. I thought I wrote an article recently on this, uh, but I write so many articles. Okay. Um, let's see, Carm, Transcendental. Let's see if I have it. Uh, Specifically, my question, like, why can't uh, other, like, you just explained the Muslim God account for it. Why can't mm-hmm. anything else account for it? Like, atheists right. might say, well, how about an alien that seeded life or whatnot? Yeah. As you know, that's a problem. The argument. The reason that's a problem yeah. is because if aliens are the ones who did it, where do the aliens come from? And are the laws of logic, for example, uh, required in their minds as well as our minds? See, the nature of the laws of logic is that they're abstract entities. We can't find the laws of logic under rocks. We can't take pictures of them. We can't put them inside of a, a Ziploc bag. They are abstractions. They occur in the mind. And what's interesting is that these abstractions relate to material world perfectly. It's really interesting. It's, well, let me in, ask you. Uh, um, yeah, I'm sorry. Let me ask you one last thing. Um. And I've watched your debates on it, and I can't remember if you answered or not. I agree uh, with the logic uh, according to mind. I think it was asked of you, or you asked, if there was no mind zero north, would the laws of logic still exist? No. If there are no minds, because the nature of the laws of logic is that they are of the mind. When I've talked about this with atheists, they just say, no, they're not. I'd say, well, good, what are they? And they'll say, well, I don't know what they are, but they're not of the mind. Well, then I have a problem with that. If you don't know what they're not, how do you know, uh, if you don't know what they are, how do you say it's not this or not that? Because it might be that. If you don't know what it is, it might be what you think it isn't. So it becomes really a problem for the atheist to say, well, no, the laws of logic are not abstract entities. Well, what are they? Oh, they're, they're propositional truth-bearing entities, you know, and they give up with something new. And so I researched that, and I found out that there are different propositional theories within in uh, philosophy, and I say, which one do you want to go with? Because each has its own problems. So yeah. the way to make sense of it all, if God's there, then that explains everything. The Trinitarian God, nothing else. Okay, buddy? Well, Matt, I appreciate the call, man. You have a good day. You too, man. God bless. All right. Hey, folks, we'll be right back after these messages. Please give me a call. It's Matt Slick Live. Taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everyone. Welcome back to the show. I know last uh, the, the last conversation we had before the break was a little bit heady. Uh, sorry about that. But... Um, these are some of the discussions that I get in with on a semi-regular basis with atheists discussing universals, particulars, transcendentals, um, primary, secondary substances, abstract entities. And the only reason I have to know these th- things is because atheists would come to me and, and say, what about this? I, well, I, I got to study it. You know? And so I developed a, a philosophy outline and I'm actually thinking about putting it online and, and um, where I go through the different philosophical positions and show and define what they are and then uh, discuss their problems because every single one of them has problems, every single one. And so I'm thinking about putting it up. I got to figure out how to do that because it would be like a uh, hundred uh, articles, you know, really quickly. And I, I just can't quite, I mean, I got to figure that out. So this is one of the things I've been working on for a long time. And uh, that's why I have those conversations because that's what's necessary in apologetics and um, it's good stuff the atheists do have a, a great deal of difficulty accounting for transcendentals as do 
as, as they relate to particulars, as do the Muslims. And so this demonstrates the inefficiency and insufficiency of the uh, secular and theological perspectives that we mentioned. Let's get to Claudius from Raleigh, North Carolina. Claudius, welcome. You're on the air. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, sir. So, I just want to know exactly why mm-hmm. um, the Resurrection Day is is popularly known as Easter Day. Easter, yeah. Are you there? Yes, yeah. I, you have any idea? What about Easter? Where it came from? No, no. Why Why is it pop- popularly known as Easter Day and not oh. Resurrection Day? Oh, why is it called Easter, not Resurrection? Okay. Oh, I get a yawn. Oh. It's because it's the when spring began, it was in Europe, in the Germanic areas, that they would celebrate the arrival of spring and a rain, and, and they would serve the the goddess Ishtar. Ishtar is Easter, so that it just kind of devolved into that frame, that that pronunciation. And one of the symbols uh, of the god Ishtar was uh, the, she was a god of, of fertility. Well, the rabbit multiplies a lot, so hence rabbit associated with Easter, which came from the pagan origin of Ishtar, and that's why it's called Easter. Uh, not Resurrection Day. It should be Resurrection Day because what's interesting is that uh, we celebrate this uh, when spring uh, comes. But that's t- in Europe. So anyway, I think it's interesting. But that's that's the history and its origin. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Well, God bless. Hey, we have nobody waiting. If you want, you can give me a call eight seven seven two zero seven. 2276 Donitis, if you are listening, you got to email me at info um, because we're trying to find the stuff you're emailing us. I, I don't know if she's listening right now because I just got a word about stuff and I'm like, what? No emails. Can't find it. So uh, we're trying to figure things out. And if she's listening, she'll know what it's about. And uh, let's see. I, we didn't lose audio and we got nothing else. We got nobody waiting. So, uh, bar- Barbecue Rabbit, someone says. <laughs> Far Out, man, was a good movie. Um, so, anyway, uh, okay, let me get to... Um, that reminds me, that reminds me. I, I got a little article up I wrote, released today, Marriage, Divorce, and Remarriage. And I, um, my ex-pastor, who's retired now, we got talking uh, on the phone about stuff. And I said, you know, what are you going to do when you're retired? He says, I don't know. I says, well, why don't you uh, consider writing for CARM? Just writing some articles every now and then, and um, so he he presented one, and um, I released it today. It's an outline he did a while back. Now this, he's uh, an old Calvary Chapel pastor, so uh, we have all kinds of people who kind of contribute here and there to Carm. I write the great majority of stuff, but uh, we have others that write an article here and there. By the way, yesterday was it over the weekend? Carm uh, passed the. 162 million, um, 162 million uh, views of, of um, individual visitors yesterday. So, or I mean, uh, over this weekend, 162 million visitors we've had to the site. How about that? 162 million. Uh, so that's pretty awesome. So uh, there you go for that. And uh, if you want to give me a call, like I said, all I have to do is dial 877 877- Two zero seven two two seven six. What's interesting is people are telling me they've lost the audio uh, here in Club- oh, in Clubhouse. You did. Well, I'm getting back into it to see if it's going to help at all, but I don't know why or what happened. So uh, there we go. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Now I'm back in. So we should be good on Rumble and in the other areas. Good. All right, nobody waiting. Let me get us some calls. Excuse me, not calls, but some uh, emails. Some of the uh, questions, some radio questions, stuff like that. All right, all right. Let's see. How about this? Uh, In my reading, 1 Thessalonians happens on the day of the Lord, 2 Peter on the day of the Lord, same day. How where can I address with dispensationalists this fact that those happen essentially the same day? Thus, I need to refute their 
in search of the seven years and millennium between the two events. Well, Conrad, the only thing you can do is read them the verses. Just read them the context, just read it to them, and just ask the question. So where is the literal thousand years if the rapture occurs on the day of the Lord to come like a thief in the night, and the new heavens and new earth are made on the day of the Lord to come like a thief? Where, how's there room for the millennium in between those, in those two statements? And that's the question. You just ask them if they refuse to, to, um, to believe that they're the same day. Well, you can't make them believe. It's just what it is. You have to deal with it. You just gonna say, well, okay, they, uh, it's they just want to say that it's uh, something different. Then let them say it's something different. You can't force them to believe. All right. What I have done many times, though, is uh, shown those scriptures to people, and it really surprises them. It really surprises them. Just like I show two men are in the field, one is taken, one is left. I show them that it's not the rapture, but it's the wicked who are taken. And people are just, their, their eyes bug out. What? What are you talking about? That's the rapture. I said, no, it's not. Read the context. And 100% of the time when I've done that, they go, oh, my goodness. It's not the rapture. And so it's really interesting to see people's reactions uh, to eschatology when you just read things in context. <laughs> and it really kind of surprises me because I will be there talking to somebody about something and they go no 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 no. this is this is rapture and go, well let's take a look and read the context and they're dumbfounded you know two men in the field one is taken one is left and uh they just they said i've never seen that before and i say i know i know you haven't and here's a question i'll ask him does your pastor teach this yes and why is your pastor not teaching seeing this too isn't he supposed to be reading the bible reading and studying it because apparently what's happening is pastors are just repeating what they've heard. It's just what it is. It's the rapture. No, it's not. So it, that's always a concern for me. And so uh, the, along the lines of, uh, you know, the rapture occurs uh, the, uh, like a thief that comes in the day of the night. Uh, like a thief that comes, like a, was it? How's that working again? A thief that comes. Oh, my goodness. Now i got to find it. Second Thessalonians, no, First Thessalonians, yeah, and it says, uh, the day of the Lord come like a thief in the night. I knew that was what it said. So that's what it is, and uh, that's the same day that the uh, new heavens and new earth are made, which means a rapture and the new heavens and new earth occur in the same day. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, I just scared a lot of people. <laughs> just, they're going, no, Matt, I love you, but you're wrong. Well, I'll say, okay, then call me up and just tell me why I'm wrong. I, I wouldn't mind being wrong. I don't have to be right about everything. The one thing I'll fight all over is um, the Trinity, the deity of Christ, resurrection, justification by faith, things like that. I'll fight for that. But other stuff, well, what do you got? Let's just see. Maybe I missed something. You know, I'm always open to that. And, uh, and I've always enjoyed people not agreeing with me. I do. I like it. You know, okay, what have you got? And I open my mind and open my heart to what they're saying because maybe they got something. That's my attitude. See, that's what's nice about what I do. Is I'm not loyal to a denomination. I don't, I'm not a member of a denomination where I have to tote the denominational line. You have to agree to it when you sign up and you have to uh, tote the denominational line in preaching and teaching. I don't have to, which is probably why. I don't get don't get asked to speak all over the place because I'll just say, well, that's let's do what does it say? You know, I, I'm not going to go with the Baptist thing or the Presbyterian thing or the cessationist thing. It's just let's, here we go, and uh, people just they they furrow their brows at me. <laughs> they furrow their brows. Oh boy. Hey, folks, we got a break coming up right there, and if you want to give me a call, eight seven seven two zero seven. Two two seven six. We'll be right back. It's Matt Slick live, taking your calls at eight seven seven two zero seven two two seven six. Here's Matt Slick. All right, well, welcome back to the show. Let's see. Next longest waiting is Kay from Durham, North Carolina. Welcome. You are on the air. Are you there? Hello, okay. 
I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting. So let's go. Oh, the noise. There Hi. you go. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Yes, so what do you got? I want to know. I want to know if you are indwelt with the Holy Spirit as soon as you ask God for forgiveness to come into your life, or are you? Do you have to speak in tongues to know that you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit when you, no, you ask for you, forgiveness? No, you, you do not have to speak in comfort. tongues. No, you do not have to speak in tongues to have the Holy Spirit. Not at all. And so you have the Holy Spirit when you receive Christ. You trust in Christ as Lord and Savior. And you are cleansed. You're justified. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Some false religious systems will say that you have to you know, get the Holy Ghost. you got to speak in tongues. That's how you know you've received the Holy Spirit. That's a load of crud. All right? It's one of the evidences of... Uh, that you have the Holy Spirit. A greater evidence is found in John sixteen eight. When he, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. So I wouldn't look to speaking in tongues as a manifestation of the Spirit. I'd look at what's the Spirit doing in your heart and your life in regard to your sanctification. Because he convicts of sin. If there is no conviction of sin, but you want to speak in tongues, I wouldn't say a per such a person is con is uh, has received the Spirit, but if the person is convicted before God, before people, of their holiness, their lack of holiness, that is their sin, and they don't speak in tongues, that is better evidence for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So, if you baptize, do you are you saved because you're baptized? No. Why you? Nope. No, it sounds to me like you're mixed up with a United Pentecostal, United Apostolic cult. Uh, I don't know if you are or not, but uh, those false religious systems or cults, they teach that you must be baptized to be saved, baptized in Jesus' name, with the mm -hmm. evidence of speaking in tongues, and that's how you know you're saved, and that those are uh, doctrines of a non-Christian cult. Both of them are cults. Okay. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, right. thank you. Yes, thank and you. Have a great day. You're welcome. Oh. And God bless. Okay. Okay. Oh. All right. Okay. You know, um, I know that there might be some UPC, United Pentecostals, or United Apostolics, who believe in oneness and the necessity of baptism and speaking in tongues and all that stuff. If you get a good representative of your religious system, I would be glad to have a public formal debate with them on this flat out. Is the Trinity true? Uh, do you, must you speak in tongues to be saved? Must you be baptized in quote in Jesus' name? Uh, be willing to debate these publicly? Uh, recorded? Moderated debates? Be willing to do that. Uh, because I, I will just stand on, on uh, the truth. And uh, the United Pentecostal is a non-Christian cult. United Apostolic non-Christian cult. Okay? So there you go. And uh, Miguel from Minnesota? Welcome. You're on the air. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I want to speak on the topic of uh, general revelation, specifically as Paul addresses it in Romans chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. Um, as you know, there are many people that have a debate that, depending on the light that you get from general revelation, if you're faithful to it, then you will eventually... Um, lead to the Lord. How do you uh, mesh that with um, the doctrine of uh, predestination? Is that something okay. that you feel that is yeah. someone who is predestined will seek the Lord, even if they're in a tribe in Africa and have no access to the gospel, God will somehow get them to that point? Sure, he can do whatever he wants. He, right now, in, in the Middle East, in Muslim countries, they are having uh, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands are having dreams of Muslims, are having dreams of Jesus. You're breathing into the mic, okay? Um, they're having d visions and dreams of Jesus, and they're coming to faith in Christ. There are countless stories of different cultures all over the world where they have remnants of the biblical gospel woven into their cultural uh, antiquities. And th so God has his way of communicating. Now, it can only be through Jesus Christ.
Some people say, well, it has to be a formal preaching of the gospel for them to be saved. I don't necessarily agree with that. I'm not saying we don't preach the gospel, but I do believe that God can certainly communicate him, his, uh, his will to people, as, as the Muslims are are being communicated in visions and dreams, and they're trusting in Christ. They are looking to him as the Savior. And I don't know what their knowledge is about his deity or his resurrection, but I think that they're getting saved, and then they will gradually come to that truth and that knowledge. And I have no problem with that. So general revelation, you mentioned uh, Romans 12, uh, excuse me, Romans 2, 12 through 16. The context there is that Paul had already condemned the Gentiles under uh, their their slavery of sin and their unrighteousness in Romans chapter 1. And so the Jews, because he's addressing the Jews here in the Roman church, he's uh, he's setting the Jews up. Uh, what he's doing is saying, well, uh, yeah, they're wrong, aren't they? And the Jews, are, as they're reading the letter or hearing the letter, are going to say, yes, that's right. They're, they're, they're in the, the Jews, excuse me, the uh, Gentiles are lost. They don't have this. They don't have that. But he goes on and in Romans chapter 2, uh, two verse 1, he says, uh, Therefore you have no excuse, everyone who passes judgment. For in that you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same thing. And in verse 17 of chapter 2, But if you bear the name Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and prove of the things, you know. And he goes on. So the context of Romans 2 is that what Paul is doing is showing the, the, uh, the Jews you're right, Jews, the Jew, the Gentiles are condemned. They have their problems. And Mr. Jew, isn't it true that if you do what's right, you're going to be okay? Well, look, hey, there are actually Gentiles who behave better by that law than you do. And that's the point of what's going on there. He says, that, and according to what he's talking about, he said, they'll be justified, won't they? Because he said, according to my gospel, that God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. So... What it looks like is uh, God has his way of communicating his gospel truth through the work of Jesus Christ to people anywhere he wants. He's not restricted uh, to the formal preaching of, uh, you know, the five, you know, the Romans road or you must preach law then gospel. Uh, I believe that this is normative and this is how God does it and we need to preach that gospel. But God has his way of uh, bringing people into the faith and he can open their hearts and their minds to believe in him and he can certainly manifest to them in visions and dreams and in person and bring them to faith just like he did with Paul and Paul didn't know who Jesus was in a lot of areas until well after he got saved in Acts chapter 9 so uh, okay and do you believe a quick follow up do you believe that uh that's how it was also in the Old Testament that there were um, people who lived in other lands who didn't have access to the Jewish people with, you know, with, with what they had with the knowledge of the law and whatnot. And God spoke to them through some manner to get them to be saved as well because they did earnestly seek the Lord. I don't know if that's true or not true. The Bible doesn't tell me. and I can't answer. I, but I can say that if anybody outside of the Jewish context is saved, it's they're saved because of the work of God upon them, drawing them, and whatever that would be and mean for them at that time. But God doesn't say that in the scriptures. He doesn't talk about it. Though there were others who believed, like the centurion, the Roman centurion, believed uh, in the true God and was, and was undoubtedly saved in you know the Gospels. So uh, I think it's possible, but I can't. I wouldn't die in that hill. It's certainly possible that everybody went to hell. But I'm not going to die in that hill e- either. The Bible just doesn't tell us. Okay? Thank you, sir. You're welcome. All right. Man. I appreciate it. All right. God bless. All right. Let's get to Bob from Nebraska. Bob, welcome. You're on the air. Thanks, Matt. Hey, as Christians, we believe that all of our sins were forgiven by Christ on the cross, right? They uh the sin debt was canceled by Christ on the cross, Colossians two fourteen. Yeah. Okay. And that includes all of our all of the sins, uh, past, present and future, even if we aren't anymore like asking for forgiveness of the sins because it all happened back twenty centuries ago, right? Yeah. Yes and no. There's a little bit of yes and no there, but but keep going. Well, 
I mean, what's the no part? Because that, that part does confuse me a little bit. So how would you better explain that understanding? Are, are you a Christian? Yes. Okay. So Jesus bore our sins in his body on the cross, First Peter 2, 24. And uh, he canceled the sin debt at the cross, Colossians 2, 14, the certificate of debt, the kerographon. This was done at the cross. So the canceling of the sin debt is not accomplished when you believe. It's accomplished by Christ on the cross. Now this blows mm-hmm. people away, but that's what it is. We do not activate the efficacy or the power of the atoning sacrifice based on our goodness, our belief. We don't activate it. It is active because of what God did on the cross. It's accomplished because of what God designed, not because of what we do. Now, we are not then, when we believe, this is a, the, it's called the now and the not yet. It's a theological perspective that is uh, now for Jesus, but not yet for us. He bore our sins, yours and my sin, and the, you know, our future sins. But we were not yet. Well, how can he do that? Well, relationship of time and things like that. Anyway, whatever. God did it. And so all of our sins, past, present, and future, your sins and my sins, past, today's, and tomorrow's and the days after, are canceled at the cross, all that sin debt. So when we pray, like, you know, you do something wrong today, I do something wrong today, we go get our knees, Lord, I'm, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Well, the sin debt is already forgiven, but it's already canceled, but we are seeking that present forgiveness because it's the reality of our condition now. So it's the now and the not so, yet. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, so the, I guess the the passage that I really struggle with then, if that's the case, because I guess what you're saying is sin's already been forgiven. We're just kind of asking for forgiveness for ourselves. It's it's not it's not a reality anymore um, for God because sin's already forgiven. And once we accept God as our Lord and our Savior, then we don't need to ask for any sins from then on out because we're believers and the sins have already been forgiven. Is that a clear? Well, when you say need, I say, yeah, we do need to still go to that cross and say, Lord, you know, I just please forgive me. And when I do that, I know I'm already forgiven, but yet I need forgiveness. It's again, okay. the now and the not yet. Mm. So then if you look at John 20, 21 through 23, mm-hmm. he said, Jesus goes into the upper room and says, the father has sent me, so I send you. Mm-hmm. And he tells them that they, ha- that the apostles have the ability to forgive sins. Nope, if you forgive the says. sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. That's not right. And so That's not it. we're out of time, but I want you to call back tomorrow. I suspect you're a Catholic or an Eastern Orthodox, but what it actually says in the Greek there in John twenty twenty three is not they are forgiven but they have been and it's a perfect tense which means the sins that they have proclaimed to be forgiven how already have been that's what's going on in the text hey we're out of time okay we are call back tomorrow okay buddy hey folks hope you enjoyed the show be back tomorrow by god's grace another program powered by the truth network